Thank you. thank you very much. Well, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, one of the things that wasn't on my bio was I'm also six foot four inches tall-ish, and I feel like the last thing I need to be doing is getting another couple of feet of elevation up here. But <clears throat> we're going to... We're going to talk today, the title of our presentation is 30 Years of Success at General Motors. Uh, Kevin is largely responsible for inventing that process and implementing that 30 years ago. I was fortunate enough to join his team about 10 years into that time frame and have functioned in different aspects of that process. So the real reason he brought me along is I'm going to give you more of the current uh, status of what we're doing with our process and even a little bit of a tease into where we're going into the future with that. So as we go through this, um, we don't call it TOC in uh, General Motors. We call it TIP because we have to have our own acronym. It stands for Throughput Improvement Process. But you'll hear me go back and forth between TIP and TOC, same, same. Wanted to uh, start out by giving you a little bit of background uh, about GM in case you haven't heard of us before. We are a small Midwestern manufacturing company. <laughs> Uh, actually a global leader in transportation services with global brands Chevrolet, Cadillac, uh, Buick, GMC, and then along with our global partners in uh, China, Korea, and Australia, we have some other global brands. Our headquarters is in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, we have engineering centers in uh, Shanghai, China, our powertrain group in Pontiac, Michigan, and then the global tech center where I work in Warren, Michigan. So, Actually, uh, as Alex mentioned, probably among the first, if not the first, to implement this on a large scale. We've had our ups and downs with that process, but uh, we've had some very big success stories too, especially recently, as recently as 2017. So we'll talk about that a little bit. But to get our story going, I want to bring Kevin up on the stage and he'll tell you about all, where it all began. Thanks, Jeff. I got you on the first slide. So the journey began about 30 years ago. How many people were involved with TOC 30 years ago? A few people. That's good. I don't feel quite as old. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So the journey uh, began 30 years ago. And uh, as Alex said, it started at the Detroit Hamtramck plant. And this is Roger Smith, who was the CEO of General Motors at the time. And he had a vision of the plant of the future. And it had something, you know, had robots uh, with body welding and color painting. And it had automated assembly systems with something that were called AGVs. And uh, uh, plant-wide use of something that was called PLCs. They were programmable logic controllers. And um, this was three years before the modern internet. We actually had uh, these plant-wide computer systems that controlled and talked to all the different systems on the plant floor. So this was pretty modern stuff. And Roger Smith had that ver a vision at the future. So this was the plan of the future. And a lot of these things, while they were a problem or considered a problem at that time, have come to pass. So these things that were brand new at that time are commonplace in the auto industry right now. And probably one of the biggest things at that time 30 years ago was team concept, and we had a big emphasis on that at the Detroit Hamtramck plant, and one of the things that we would do is once a week on Tuesdays, we would take a half an hour and go through the status of the plant and what was going on. So uh, Roger was a big um, influence on how this went and uh, really uh, talked about the plan of the future, although you may see one or two of these issues come up as problems uh, today in certain companies. Um, so our starting point was in 1987, and I was at the Detroit Hamtramck plant, and they were far behind their uh, targets as far as throughput was concerned. Uh, and it was on the edge of being cons considered a failure. Imagine that you have all these uh, technological uh, advances that you were trying to get into the system, and they were having problems trying to get it all worked. That's a big list of technological things that they were trying to do. So to get all this complexity to work, and hit throughput targets was very, uh, was very aggressive from that perspective. And so it was considered at the time the worst plant in the corporation. They were just not hitting their targets and um, the, the feeling was you took on too much at one time and that was a problem. And this is the first case of hopium and uh, you're going <laughs> to hear me talk about this 
Uh, you fix something and you hope it had an impact. So these systems were so complex that we would fix something, uh, and of course I was an electrical engineer on the floor, and you would fix something and you'd say a little prayer, and you would hope that it would have some impact on the end of the line. But because the systems were so complex, you never knew if throughput went up, if that was something you did, or it happened to be something about the weather that day. So you didn't really know if that had a difference or not. So as I said, I was assigned as an electrical engineer. I had just gotten uh, done with my master's program at Purdue University, and they shuttled me off to the floor and said, you need to help uh, get things to improve on the plant floor. So I was uh, told by the plant manager that this is something you need to go do. And uh, I look pretty close to that still, right? That's... So we should be making 65 jobs an hour. We're only making about 57. Uh, I hear that this, this uh, Dave Vanderveen guy at Research has some software that he wrote. And he seems like a pretty smart guy. So go up to Warren and meet him. That's the technical center where both uh, Jeff and myself worked at one point. Or Jeff still does, actually. So I went up to see um, Dave, and, I, and one of the things that we had come to uh, realize is that we had no idea what we were doing. The system was so complex and so difficult that we had to admit to ourselves that the traditional thinking that we had was no longer good enough. And so Dave Vanderveen, who had worked at the University of Michigan and came up with a, with a lot of this methodology, unfortunately, uh, Dave has recently passed away. I wanted him to give part of the presentation, uh, and so part of the presentation today is um, in honor of him. Very smart guy, PhD in operations research, and he um, did two things. He gave me a copy of this goal book, and he said, you want to read this, because it talks about this concept of bottleneck, so go ahead and read this book, and uh, use this software, which is called See Through, which we developed back in 1986, and we want you to put this into the plant and install this software. So um, it really did a couple things uh, with us. If you've read the goal, you realize that two of the things that are critical is you have to define a system with dependencies and you have to capture variation. Those are two key aspects that are revealed in the goal. If you have missed that, go back to the scene where uh, Jonah is talking to Alex. I think it's in the airport lobby. And he talks about dependencies and variation. So, um, but we did it because the software asked us to do that. So, uh, so we, we, what the first thing that we had to do was write the system down. And as simple as that sound, with all the complexity that we had in the plant, we had not created a diagram like this. In fact, we had multiple names for different things on the plant floor. The headliner might be the headliner from one station or one group. It was called station 134 for another group. And so just getting a common naming methodology and outlining the dependencies was a big deal. Uh, and then we had to go through the system and we had to, uh, that's not the pointer. Okay, the, uh, we had to capture this variation and we had to use some new terms. There were some terms like mean cycles between failure and mean time to repair or to resume. These were ind indicative of failures on the floor and captured variability. So these are two things that were necessary on the plant floor. Of course, I first had to read the goal, and we read it in about two nights, uh, and it was fascinating stuff. Told me all the things that I need to know, and then I, I could go through and put the software in. Now, because I was a controls engineer, I had information to all of these things. So, went out to the plant floor, I could capture all this data for the area that I was in, which was General Assembly, and took the software and put it in, and I got this nice little Pareto chart. And the Pareto chart showed us where the bottleneck was. And so I was really excited because I could go out now and find out who to blame for these problems, which was one of my goals at the time. And so I went out, and this was a small woman that was holding these headliners, which of course is the material that's inside the roof of your car. And I had this data which said the mean cycles between failure was five, which meant you ran five parts and then you stopped the line. And the mean time to resume or to repair was 72 seconds. So I took my trusty stopwatch out there and I watched her for a while. And what she would do is take five of these headliners and she would uh, go get them from some location, drop them on the floor. She'd pull out the e-stop, which is the emergency stop, which she was using for production. And so that's like going through a door on the movie theater and hitting the emergency door. Same thing, she would pop the emergency stop and she'd put five down 
and she'd build five cars, and then she'd pull the emergency stop again, and then she'd disappear, and then she'd come back with five more of those. So <laughs> I don't recommend that as an assembly technique. Uh, so I asked her, you know, why are the baskets for the headliners so far away from the workstation? And she said, I don't know, talk to the forklift driver. Of course, there was so much going on that uh, it was a very confusing place. So she said, you know, one day they just stop dropping them off here and I have no idea. So I have to go through this maze of baskets to find the parts. So of course, I went to uh, find the forklift driver. And uh, I asked him, why did you stop delivering headliners baskets to the workstation? And he said, well, I nicked the supervisor's office once and he got upset with me. So I had to move the, the baskets to another location. So I went to where the office was, and you can see that tiny little nick that was in the office there. And so I asked him, I said, uh, why didn't you get your office moved? And he looked at me and said, well, aren't you for, from tech support? That was called maintenance, or that's maintenance. Well, I put a work order in to have this office moved four months ago. Why aren't you doing your job? And of course, I realized where the bottleneck was, and it was me. So, so I couldn't blame anybody at that time, which was unfortunate. Uh, so it became a simple fix, which was typical with the throughput improvement process. I looked through the uh, 4,000 or so fixes that we had at that particular time with the amount of uh, fixes that we had to go do. And down there with the offices too hot and too cold, there was move the 30, H35 office. So, so I told Charlie, who was in charge of uh, moving stuff around the plant, that I needed to have an office moved. And he looked at me and said, I thought you were in charge of throughput. And, and he, so I explained to him, to being an engineer, in, uh, in exacting detail about why we needed to do this. And he just said, OK, fine, I'll move the office. <laughs> so so uh, we, uh, we did this. And we, we moved the office, and of course, the young lady who was moving the headliners now could just take the parts right out of the basket. The problem went away and throughput went up. And of course, you know, being on Hopium for so long it was like, well, maybe that was just luck. Uh, we'll, ha we'll have to do it again and see if that really worked or not. So we did it again and we did it again and we did it again. And finally we, we concluded that, well, gee, it looks pretty consistent. Maybe we should set up a process to do this over time. So we were using this see-through tool, excuse me, and using it over time. So I was asked to go ahead up and set up a process and uh, decided to call it the throughput improvement process, which was focused on the concepts from the goal. So we would take this plant floor monitoring system uh, with all this data that we had from the plant floor. We do the see-through bottleneck analysis. We'd have weekly bottleneck location meetings where we take all the data. We would find where the bottleneck was, and then we would start a process of uh, fixing and often it was uh, a lot of times it was very simple uh, you would they had done something dumb uh, in order and created longer cycle times or had done something to create downtime uh, sometimes it was a little more um, difficult and then the daily plant meetings they got together and said you know where the bottleneck is right so make sure you understand where it is and don't do anything to it that's damaging which was a worthwhile thing as well because knowledge of the bottleneck made sure that they weren't uh, damaging in any way and they can make some decisions around that and then we repeat and we do the next week we would do the monitoring and we'd find the next bottleneck and typically the bottlenecks would move around the plant uh, with the amount of complexity that we had in the system so a plant manager uh, went through the process and we had done this in general assembly and it worked very well so we would buy another box of the goal and take the the uh, see-through uh, part and we take the tip process and we go to the paint shop and the paint shop said that won't work here uh, we are different in the paint shop and so we had the the benefit of having this relatively simple process and then we put it in and plant throughput would go up and of course now we had to go to the body shop and they said it won't work here we are different in the body shop and then we put it in and plant throughput would go up and so now, we started to get very steady at, for, uh, as far as throughput was concerned. In fact, because we created some buffer at the end of the line, we didn't see any variation in plant throughput, which was, you know, at that point, people would come to the plant and they would draw the obvious conclusion, which is you're lying 
about your throughput. <laughs> and uh, which, you know, I'll leave that one alone. Uh, so we went from uh, worst to first. We went from being the worst plant in the corporation to the best plant in the corporation in a relatively short period of time. And uh, that gained some attention because there were plants, uh, other plants in the corporation who had demand that uh, were suffering from poor throughput. They showed up and we went through why this was. We showed them the data. We showed them how the analysis worked. And uh, they were quite interested in what we were doing. And then eventually we got divisional people and headquarters people and they were interested in what was going on. So eventually over time, <clears throat> they decided to spread it in the division. Now a key part of this is because the divisional headquarter people, divisional leadership I should say, had gone and seen this in a plant, they believed it. It wasn't like they were, trust they were trusting a consultant or somebody else to say, well, this, you know, trust us, this works. They'd gone to the plant, they had seen it, and they had seen the cause and effect. So when we went through this process, we could go back to that and distribute copies of the goal, which I think for a long time, GM was the biggest purchasing of, uh, of the goal. We'd buy them by the boxes, um, so we bought a lot of them. And then we put together a team. We, bought, we got controls engineers, we got throughput improvement engineers, we had people from research, we had people from simulation that all came to be part of this team. This was not a one day thing. This grew over years that we put these teams together because we wanted to make sure it didn't cost the plan anything. We wanted to make sure that wasn't an obstacle to us. You want to put it in place, it doesn't cost you anything. So we would go to the plant and what would they tell us? It won't work here in the plant because we're different here in this particular plant. And then we put it in because we had our own resources. We had our own controls engineers. We could put it in very quickly and the throughput would go up. And then we go to the next plant and they would say, it won't work here because we're different in our plant. And the plant throughput would go up again. Uh, go up again. So uh, we went to plant, to plant, to plant, to plant. And of course this took years uh, as we went to all the plants. And finally the constraint reached the tipping point. It went from manufacturing and it went into uh, product uh, design. And so we went from an interesting point from a manufacturing perspective where we no longer had to convince people that we wanted to do tip. People ca called us and said, when are you gonna come to my plant and put the throughput improvement process in because you're late? <laughs> I didn't know we had a time schedule. So, so, um, so that was nice to see that common practice come into being where people expected us to show up and put this process in place. So this had a huge impact on GM from, uh, first of all, from a, a quantitative perspective. And again, this goes back to where we were in about 2004. We had, a, at that point, we had a documented uh, revenue increase of $2.15 billion. And this was across stamping, powertrain, and vehicle assembly. It was a key enabler uh, for a 26% improvement in productivity. And from, uh, this is from 97 to 2004, as measured by the Harbor Report, which is the report that measures from the outside what the productivity of different organizations is. And then in 2004, it says, I don't know why we're keeping measuring this stuff. I mean, you know, it's, it's what we do. We don't have to bother tracking it anymore because Every, it's in every plant, we're doing it in every plant. I don't know why we bother to track it. So it became the common process. It became the way, this is the way we do things at GM. We all, there's a tip engineer in every plant. We, you, you put uh, data collection in every machine. So when you turn it on for the first time, it starts collecting data for the throughput improvement process. So that became the common process. So when you talk about this from the uh, quantitative perspective, there was more effective uh, PM pr uh, practices. You knew where the bottleneck was. There was no excuse not to do PM on the bottleneck. You had to make sure that kept running. And of course, it reduced non-scheduled overtime because you could figure out areas that needed overtime and areas, of course, that didn't need overtime. And so, uh, because throughput would go up, of course, you could reduce that overtime, but you could also figure out what areas you know, that you didn't need to work overtime because we were trying to be fair and have everyone work overtime. Reduce the total investment in uh, new product launches. Um, this is what Jeff works in. It's part of the simulation process. 
and we, call, we started to call the simulation process that time the self-defense mechanism because it prevented executives from doing something extremely stupid during the design phase. When they said, let's cut costs, let's take this machine out, and of course, once it was proven that the machine was necessary for throughput during the launch, then they'd open the checkbook and, and pay lots of money to fix. So it wasn't so much that we were predicting throughput accurately as much as we were preventing people from doing incredibly stupid things. Are we on video about the executive thing? Because you know, maybe, 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 maybe dumber's not a good term. I don't work for GM anymore, it doesn't matter. But so <laughs> data collection. Uh, so we also put standard data collection and performance metrics into the system, which allowed us to uh, enable uh, transfer of lessons learned from different manufacturing uh, positions. So we had a standard definition about data. So when I talked about mean cycles between failure at one plant in Arlington, it made exactly the same thing as mean cycles between failure at Pontiac. It didn't make a difference. No one was playing with the data to get the answer they wanted because it was the PLCs collecting this data. <clears throat> we reduced total investment and improved new product. What came up before? And we talked about uh, plant floor data collection uh, became widely available across the corporation and uh, <clears throat> historical database. So what happened is because we had all this data and it was a tre tremendous amount of data and it was standardized, we could start using this data for new system designs. And so we started to categorize this. So we have a four robot respot station and that downtime is mean cycle between failure of is this number and the meantime, mean time to repair is this number. And so you can use that in future designs and make sure that you have the right data. Organizationally, we had to better understand uh, a need for better uh, data-driven decisions in system performance analysis. Their system performance analysis is an important aspect of this because we used to do it by little silos, right? Here's the machine workstation, and you just have to, you can take those out and just do them by silo. Now we were looking at everything from a system performance standpoint, which you really hadn't done before. And we can go to continuous improvement with a shift from local improvement to system level optimization. And that sounds, you know, like a one sentence, but, you know, not a big deal. That's a huge deal for a company the size of General Motors. And then a dedicated central organization was formed. We had one group that was responsible, and the group was throughput analysis and simula uh, simulation. I was an executive there. Uh, so I was the executive for throughput analysis and simulation. And if you would have asked me at that particular time what they did, I would give you some answer that didn't make any sense because I was not allowed to talk about what I did in GM. It was, conf it was confidential. And so we had drove uh, implementation with throughput coordinators in every car and truck plant. An active user uh, community was established to share best practices. We got together every once in a while. Sometimes it was... Uh, uh, via Skype and often it was just getting together and talking about how we were doing certain things. And then one of the things we did at the time was we established a bottleneck busters award. Whatever plant had done really good, uh, really well in establishing throughput improvement got a bottleneck busters award. So let's talk uh, about the process at GM today and I'll give you back over to Jeff. Kevin does a great job with that story, right? Describing the 30 year history. And uh, what he left out was the fact that he left me with the bill of goods to, to finish it. So uh, I am still currently working at GM and I wanted to, uh, to just take it from that point in the story and tell you a little bit about what we're doing today with the process. Talk about some of the success stories that we've had and also a glimpse into the future where we're going with this. So there's been a lot of refinement over the 30 years that Kevin described. Um, as he mentioned, you know, now we use simulation to um, not only solve problems at the plant floor, but also in advance of our new vehicle programs. So <clears throat> we're looking at vehicle programs that are three to four years from hitting the production floor, predicting where our bottlenecks or our problem areas are gonna be and using that data to drive decisions. So we actually set capacity in advance and we design in the bottleneck. So that's kind of a revolutionary thought to some people. And just to jump in here, you know, designing in the bottleneck was a real revolutionary thing. It's like, well, so you're, just, you're telling me 
that we're going to design in the problem in the plant. And uh, we spent, it sounds simple, but we spent a lot of time uh, struggling with this issue. And it finally come, came down to, would you like the fates to decide where the bottleneck is and then try to, <laughs> try to figure it out? Or would you like to design it in and know where it's going to be and be able to, to take whatever the situation was as far as the design of the plant and make sure we understood how to optimize and keep it there over time uh, and make sure that we got the best production out of that bottleneck, mostly based upon investment and, where, and how difficult it would be to move the bottleneck. So, right. Um, Good point, Kevin, because um, as we develop a new vehicle program and put it into a plant, those plants are all different. Sometimes we have legacy equipment with known issues as far as production capability. Uh, sometimes it's more of a greenfield approach where it's brand new investment from the ground up. Uh, sometimes we have plants that are very focused on one vehicle, say they're building a, a Chevy Cruze or something like that, and that's all they do. Other times we have plants that are building four or five different models, and it's very complex and a lot of differentiation between those models. So depending on the situation, that's going to dictate where we design in the bottleneck to that process. And then the other thing that happens is over the course of time, as we're going through this planning cycle, we use these simulation models then to become the tracking models on our plant floor. So that same model that predicted where the problem was going to occur three years ago is now going to be used on the plant floor to track where it actually is happening. And that data feeds into our TIP process that we call WebTIP. That TIP process is used within all levels of the plant and across all of our different uh, types of organizations. Between stamping, our castings facilities, our components plants, our vehicle assembly, and our powertrain facilities, they all use this process. And at the end of the presentation, I'll show you some testimonials from different leaders in those organizations that shows just how widespread this process has become. So it informs our plant leadership, you know, whether it's daily or weekly meetings that they have to uh, understand where the bottlenecks are happening in the produ production process. But probably the most significant thing is it allows our team leaders to focus on the top problems. So the way our workforce is organized in the plant, our team leaders typically have five to six hourly employees, team members, that report to them. So each of those teams functions as an autonomous group, solving their own problems, but within the scope of the overall goal of the organization in terms of safety, quality, cost, responsiveness, and the environment. So as they're doing this, and we're reporting out on our top bottlenecks, if you were to go down on the plant floor and say to somebody, what is TOC, they might not know what you're talking about, even if you spelled out the acronym Theory of Constraints. It's not something that we teach at that level to everybody. What they understand is what their part in the problem-solving process is, and they know that they don't want to be the top three on that bottleneck list, right? If you're the top three, you're going to get a lot of attention and a lot of help on a weekly basis to solve your problems. But if you're not in the top three, you have some motivation there to keep it that way, right? So all those teams that are not part of the top three bottlenecks are working offline to make sure that it stays that way. So whether it's positive or negative reinforcement, there is uh, incentive there to stay off of that list. And that's what they know and they understand is how the, bo or how the problem solving process fits into that methodology. And so we're using this approach to get much more consistent than we used to be at meeting launch targets and meeting our production schedules. And so as this process has endured and evolved over the years, where it was formerly um, the production process that Kevin described, where we had plant floor monitoring, uh, we had the uh, information flowing through see through that identified the bottleneck, we had weekly bottleneck meetings and plant meetings, and that was this repetitive cycle. It's now also in the design process. So we use all that data coming off the plant floor from real life uh, experience to feed into what we call a plant uh, phase zero database. So as Kevin described, if we have a particular type of station, say a four robot respot station, we have an expectation of how that system is going to perform in real life. And then we feed that data into our simulation models and now we do design reviews, just like we were doing the plant reviews on a weekly basis, to where we run the simulation model, predict where their throughput issues are going to be, get some brain power associated to that, and try to figure out those, those issues of how to improve that system. And then we rinse and repeat with the simulation. 
So we have a kind of three-pronged approach that we refer to as the three-legged stool. We have a data collection group which is focused on um, installing and maintaining the data collection logic on the plant floor. We have a throughput improvement team that's kind of that, that roving bottleneck busting team that goes from plant to plant and offers some special assistance to help do that. And then we have my team which is in the simulation organization. So altogether, uh, headquarter wise, we probably have about 65 employees dedicated between the three different pieces of that three-legged stool. And then we have a, a tip coordinator in every plant and we have uh, controls engineers also doing the logic in the plant uh, floor. So I don't know if the scope of that sounds big or small to you understanding the size of General Motors, but the real power of it, again, is not the 65 people. It's also the piece of that is owned on those teams and those team leaders solving those problems every day. So that's where we, we gain the traction from it is that implementation on the plant floor. So I wanted to focus a little bit on um, current achievements. And uh, we had a very good year in 2017. Highlighted with our, the launch of our uh, Bolt electric vehicle, the Chevy Bolt, actually launched in October of 2016. But our launch acceleration curve is typically about six months. So when you start producing a new vehicle, within about six months time, you expect to be up to full production capacity. So that would have been about the end of March for us at that time. And it just so happens that one of the prior roles I had before coming to headquarters again was I was the lead industrial engineer at the assembly plant where we produced the Bolt. And so a little bit unique because I have that type of background as an industrial engineer, I was able to uh, lead our tip efforts in the plant as well. So here we have an electric vehicle that we're producing on the same assembly line along with other gas powered vehicles. This was really the first um, mass production of an electric vehicle in that type of environment that I know of being produced right side by side in the same production line as our gas powered uh, Chevy Sonics and Buick Veranos. So when I was preparing this presentation I was told that we don't typically mention competitors um, but some of you may be aware that there's another company somewhere west of here <laughs> attempting to do similar things right to varying degrees of success. So one of the things that you find is that whether you've had 100 years of experience in doing this or just a few years of experience, we have common problems. Um, so it's very easy to pick off production problems in the, in the beginning. You have large problems, you solve them, you move on, you move up that curve. But then what tends to happen is you hit a plateau. So in our case, we were supposed to build 330 vehicles per shift, and you get up to about 300 and then there's just this remaining little gap that becomes the, the challenge. How do you, now you've got little scattered problems all over, uh, you know, not big things, but they're just nitpicky things that are just dragging down your production. So this was really the key um, for us was use, using this process to get through those, those problems. And in the end, the launch of the Bolt was hailed as one of the most successful launches in the corporation. TIP played a large role in that, and I, and I think, um, Similar to what you heard with the Hitachi presentation uh, earlier this morning, we wouldn't take credit for all of that, but it certainly played a, a large role in identifying the bottlenecks, particularly in the general, general assembly process where we did have the, these two different kinds of vehicles going down the line one after the other. So, you know, a gas-powered Chevy has a gas tank and an engine. Electric vehicle has a motor and no gas tank. So there's all these differences in the balance of the workflow between the workers and solving those problems is where the TIP process came into play. So at the end of the year, uh, this is uh, part of a press release that stated, you know, General Motors being the leader in affordable long-range electric vehicles delivered more than 43,000 units in 2017, 23,000 of which were the Bolt, along with 47,000 of the Chevy and uh, Verano vehicles. So very successful launch, so much so that um, the former VP of our manufacturing organization highlighted it as a model of how to engage the entire workforce at all levels to achieve that success. And at the same time, the vice president of the UAW also acknowledged that it was only through this innovative problem solving approach were we able to see this plant succeed. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with our environment, it's not typical for union and management to agree on stuff. So this is a pretty big deal. 
So that was, a, that was a good success story for 2017, but I also wanted to give you a glimpse into the future of where we, we see this journey going. And uh, we heard a, a little bit about Industry 4.0 this morning in the presentation from John. And we very much so uh, also incorporate uh, TOC thinking into our what we call our manufacturing 4.0 transformation. So for those of you unfamiliar with the terminology, you know, industry or manufacturing 4.0 refers to the major industrial revolutions that have occurred over time. In the 1800s, you had mechanization and water power. Turn of the 19th century, mass production and assembly lines with electricity, and that was kind of where the auto industry was born. Uh, and then in the 70s and 80s, we had the computer revolution and much more automation on our production floor. And then finally, as we look towards what will be the fourth major revolution, that's expected to be a cyber physical systems with uh, machines and humans and, and stations communicating with, with each other with the internet as the backbone of that communication system. So I didn't create this slide. This is readily available off the internet. But what I did was I mapped where our TOC journey has kind of begun and where we see it going. So, in that 1987 time frame, we did have uh, some huge technological advances. Kevin was able to develop a system where we had automated data collection producing our bottleneck reports. But from that point on, it was largely a uh, manually driven process. You looked at that report, you formed a team to go take action on the floor, you came back next week, you saw what the results were going to be. Going forward, using the, the simulation technology, we became a little bit more predictive. Now we're looking into the future with our new vehicle programs. Where do we expect those problems to crop up? And then as we look towards the, that fourth revolution out there, we're going to be moving towards more real-time information and more self-optimization. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next couple slides. So it's, <clears throat> again, this is a, a stock slide that describes a uh, maturity model for a smart factory, but I think it plays really well into our TOC journey because it talks about the use of data, and it all starts with big data, connected data, <clears throat> and visualizing where your issues are at. What is that data telling you? Understanding what the linkage is between systems and then being more predictive and moving towards that self-optimization. So I think the good thing here is that on the far right, it talks about optimization being based on holistic view and the total enterprise cost. That fits in perfectly with the TOC mission, right? That's good news for us. It also talks about the connection of humans, machinery, and smart devices to increase productivity and minimize defects. And I think that's also what TOC is all about. So what I did was I mapped that maturity model to where I think our process has been and where I think it's going. And so when you look at the first 30 years, you know, we had the, the automated data collection. We were building computer models to identify where the bottleneck was, and we were taking action on that. But again, that was largely a manually driven process. Once we had the bottleneck identification, we're going out to the floor and, and manually intervening in those processes. As we get into the near term, we're getting into more advanced cycle time monitoring. So the way my group works today, we look at total cycle time. And when you have this connected system with all these dependencies, you look for stations or operations that are over cycle. But going into the future, we've got some more advanced monitoring to where we're looking at micro components of that cycle time. So we've got systems that are monitoring the clamp time of the robot on the part. And we don't program any logic into that in terms of understanding what it should be or shouldn't be. The system learns itself over repetition what the pattern is and what part of the process that plays in the overall thing. So when it sees degradation in that clamp time, it knows there's an issue and now it can initiate some corrective action for that. So we're able to identify emerging issues much quicker. And another component of this is better reporting. So as great as the system was that Kevin developed, it was largely developed by engineers for engineers. And that's been one of the criticisms over, over time, is that you have to be an engineer to poke, be able to dig into the data and find what you're looking for. So another key aspect of that going forward for us is bringing that data forward to all the, the players in the organization and making it much more intuitive to find what you're looking for. And so when we have that combination, we've got more advanced analytics. And then going out into the future, we get closer and closer to real-time reporting, more predictive analysis, and more preventative tip 
actions that are initiated by the equipment themselves rather than humans intervening in the process. So more optimization scenarios that are automatically tested before it even comes to light that we've got an issue out there. And so this is a little snippet. Again, I didn't create this slide. This one I lifted from our IT organization. But this shows uh, a current implementation that's uh, being called the Manufacturing Dashboard. And it's a vision of the future of about a next generation business system that will provide plant-wide historical and near, -time, uh, near real time metrics in a large scorecard of operations at a glance. And so the thing I thought that was interesting about this was, uh, again, I didn't create this, but they recognized that a key element of this would be the tip reporting. And in fact, it would be the first phase of the manufacturing dashboard that responds to that. So this is expected to be something that will be available on everybody's mobile device, whether it's a phone or um, an iPad. And I wouldn't expect this to make much uh, sense to anybody just glancing at it, but the key aspect of it is that it's going to bring out elements that you'll recognize of a TOC approach, buffer analysis, downtime reporting, bottleneck reporting, and our tip action planning, and put that in the fingertips of everyday users who are you know, doing their jobs on the plant floor Again, have this on their mobile device and they're one click away from this data and this information. So our modern theory of constraints is indeed uh, pursuing or moving forward without hopium and more in the direction of technology such as this. So bringing this all back to where we've been, um, this was a nice little quote when we were putting this presentation together that was contributed by the former uh, president of General Motors who was very influential in Kevin's career and in fact, as Kevin was rising from controls engineer to a director level, uh, he was doing so while Gary Calger was seeing the benefits of this process and, and supporting that all the way. So it was recognized that the results were so significant that we began to use it in all of our operations. So TIP, along with some of our other lean processes, has, us allow, has allowed us to increase productivity over the last 30 years and has been the foundation for continuous improvement into the future. And then to echo that sediment, where do we go from here? This quote is from my direct leadership, which recognized that, yes, in the beginning, we did need innovation and we needed leaders and champions to get this process off the ground and approved. And we did utilize technology to do that. And that was related to the, uh, the data collection and the, and the bottleneck identification system that Kevin developed. But once we did that and we had success with it, it became a habit. And now, as that that belief in the process spread across the corporation. We didn't need as much leadership to drive the process. And going forward, it's technology again that'll play a role in driving improvements to that process and bringing it more accessible to everyday users. And so as I mentioned, uh, I, we just threw the, these quotes in. I don't expect you necessarily to read them all, but just notice at the bottom kind of the, the breadth across the organization in terms of who's using it, how they recognize that it's a key aspect of their business. So this comes from our propulsion or engine side of the business. This one is from our uh, Flint assembly plant manager, or engineering director, I'm sorry, who has used TIP throughout his career to be successful. Uh, plant manager of Flint stamping process, recognize that an effective TIP process is key. Uh, our lock port components holding operation, uh, operations components are the small parts that go into our vehicles. And this recognizes that it's compressed the time that it used to take to make improvement. And it also is used to make employees happier because they're part of the process. Our Lord Sound Assembly Director who said it's not rocket science, but it does take perseverance. And finally, our castings uh, manage, plant manager who recognized the origins of this coming from Ellie Goldratt and has used it everywhere he's been to be successful. So I think that just kind of shows, you know, all parts of the organization are using this. Um, it's, it's been part of that past success for the last 30 years and it's definitely a key component of where we're going in the future. And so to wrap that up, we'll just have Kevin cover a couple of bullets on one or two more slides. Yeah, just a quick uh, summary here. <clears throat> get uh, through this. I think that uh, one of the reasons, this is one of Ellie's favorite implementations, is it just came from the goal. Uh, I'd like to thank all the consultants who helped us with this. Okay. Uh, <laughs> this is the third and probably the last time GM will talk about this. 
We talked at TOC World 2000. We talked when we won the TOC or the Informs uh, Franz Adelman Award in 2005, which we won against companies like GE and HP, and of course we're presenting now, mostly to acknowledge the TOC community and the impact that it's, it's had on uh, General Motors and the success of the TIP process. And I'd ask you to do a little active listening after this session. Uh, find out how many people say this won't work at our uh, location because it's different here. So just to find that out. And also we have something, uh, Jeff is not going to do any uh, training here, but we, I have written a book which is called uh, Addicted to Hopium, and it's really about tip 2.0. It applies more to throughput and lead time and inventory. So if you'd like to know more about uh, the throughput improvement process, this is available on Amazon as well. So, and I think that's it. So, questions? Please uh, join me halfway. <laughs> Very impressive presentation. Over 30 years, but I have an inconvenient question to ask. Okay. What is the result in profits in 30 year period? What is the annual growth rate of profit after tax for General Motors as a whole, not as a part of the General Motors? You're not turned on at the moment, Kevin. <laughs> oh, good. Use this one. Okay. So we had uh, $2.1 billion, and then we stopped keeping track uh, at that particular point because you know, it became a standard process. So that's net income. We only did this in plants that had demand. We just didn't do it for the hell of it. Uh, so we only went to plants that had demand. If we didn't have demand, we didn't do it. So that's to the bottom line. Does that answer the question? OK, any, any other questions? Any final questions? Again, please join me halfway. <laughs> Thank you. Very good story. Has there been any use of TOC in synchronizing the corporation to the market? Sounds like you guys have done some fantastic work at the manufacturing level. But I often see, oh, we're laying off this plant or putting it off because we're making too many cars and have to wait. Or the market decided not to buy these. Have you been able to extract it up to that level? Well, I think <coughs> um, a little bit of that is, is outside of our control. I think you may have read, read recently in, uh, in the news this past week or so where Ford is taking a major directional shift about not producing as many sedans anymore, going more in the uh, crossover SUV truck market, right? So um, a little bit of that goes to you know, the price of gasoline and uh, where the profits are and, and so forth. So there's probably some application of that to that line of thinking, but it goes beyond my pay grade. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> I don't have a, a lot of direct insight as to how specifically that's being used at that level, but there's a lot of outside influences when you get to that level in terms of strategic planning. So we all know, you know, this is a cyclic industry. Sometimes you can predict that, sometimes you can't. Sometimes financial markets collapse, and sometimes you go through periods of great growth and cheap gas prices and everybody wants SUVs, so. And there was something called the Enterprise Project. So the Enterprise Project uh, that Ellie did with uh, GM on the, on the uh, yeah, on the, that side of things that they did down in Florida, and um, that uh, worked pretty well at the beginning and then sort of fell apart. One of the things that we see as the major long-term constraint is something called management churn. We avoided that in the TIP process by how we designed it. We didn't avoid that in the enterprise project, so we had so many people churning over, it was a problem, and plus the, uh, 
we don't sell to customers, we sell to the dealers. The dealers actually sell to customers, so we, we have that barrier obstacle in the way of that solution. Any, any final questions from anyone? Okay, well I would like to, to join you on stage and to offer my very sincere thanks for a wonderful presentation to both of you. We have a little uh, thank you here as well. So first of all to Jeff, thank you very much indeed. And thank you to Kevin, very much indeed. <laughs>